we're going to start properly on time, which is another five minutes. So I thought I'm just going to show the photos from the last two trips. So for those uh, who don't know us, uh, we actually work together to do the tech trips. So uh, my company is Insider Diverse, but um, Phil is uh, our tech expert. He takes people uh, on the tech part of our trips. And we've done two truck lagoon trips, which I think is fitting just to show a couple of photos. This works. There you go. So this was from our 2018 trip. We always do funny group photos above and below the water. Here we are in the Rio in the engine room because um, we uh, we do go and get muddy inside the wrecks. This is the Hokie, one of my favorites because you've got nine trucks in there. This was the, I think this is the Yamagiri, if I don't remember, or I'm not even quite sure which one this one was. Ah, here, the San Francisco Maru. That's the classic. If you've never been to truck, this is the, the big highlight, but you should be a tech diver to go down there. This is in the belly, in the cargo of the, um, of the San Francisco Maru. You see here on the side, these are all mines, which are actually live. So it's quite special to dive into that cargo hold. The whole hold is full with mines, the whole sides. And then they have uh, several uh, torpedoes in there as well. Very special spot. This was a 2019 group. The only person not smiling is Phil. <laughs> but We like this photo. Um, <laughs> this is our, our favorite guide. What's his name? Phil Hanser. Yeah, Hanser, right. So they actually are all Team Hanser or Team Beetlenut. Uh, several people who came several times. One of my favorite photos here of Nick. Chris took that one. That's in the Rio as well, I think, in the side. Mm -hmm. And this one should be the San Francisco Maru as well, I think. I wasn't on this trip, so I need Yeah, to I believe so. Because the, the one on the look. Nipmo doesn't have the uh, doesn't have the barrel. Yeah, I believe that's that's the San Francisco. And then this one, I'm not quite sure which one this one is, but it looks pretty deep because it's got the deep whip coils. You remember which one this is? No, not that particular photo. Hard, eh? in, in, in a week, we do so many wrecks, so they start like overlapping and we just, yeah, it's really hard to <laughs> actually separate them. Ah, Julie and Simon also here. So Simon took this photo. Simon, which one is this? I think he also can't remember. He's just saying he did that when you guys left. <laughs> uh, you remember the name, Simon? He's silent. I think he's looking into his logbook. <laughs> Quite <laughs> possible. Yeah, that doesn't look that familiar. So it might be when they did, no, when they stayed I, that I, extra that's week. They did the week after. Um, yeah. As you can see, it's like a smaller one, but it's got these super long whip coils. So it must be pretty deep. Yeah. And then well, coming up. It looks up like it's sitting family, next to a slope, but that might just be the way the yeah. photo is taken. Oh, it probably is on a slope. <laughs> he went to get the truck book, his wife said, or his uh, girlfriend said. Um, and this, we're coming up to my favorite picture of that trip. So this is in the Nippo, Maru, the bridge. No, sorry, no, this is not the Nippo. This, you know, this is the Nippo, right? This is the Nippo, right? But then this one is the best one, I think, of the Captain. Oh, yeah. Good old R2, E2, and Captain America. And then the Fujikawa, I think. I think it's Fujikawa. Mm -hmm. Really hard to separate them all. I've been there five times now. I still struggle sometimes with the individuals. Well, I hope you guys all enjoyed that. We have another two minutes. So we're just going to wait for that and then we'll start on time. How's it in Florida anyway? It's good. Um, it's almost 8 a.m. in the morning, nice and sunny. It gets up to about 30 degrees midday. The beach has just reopened. So the city's really filling up because it's, it's a tourist city, but people drive to it, mainly from Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina, and those areas. So as soon as the beach is opened, everybody was like, all right, it's time to get back out there. So diving so, is allowed now as well? Sorry, right. Yeah, it's allowed now. Wow. But uh, I mean, people keep the distance, the beach is long. We're talking a, you know, 25 kilometer beach. So there's plenty of space for people to spread out. Okay. You gonna go diving? 
Oh, you told me. Um, um, hopefully. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, flying, I'm flying back to Sweden in four days. So. Is that confirmed? Out of time. Is that confirmed? Maybe I'll get to diving in in Sweden, depending on if um, I make it uh, on to in, back to Indonesia after that, uh, as soon as I want to, or if I stay in Sweden a little bit over the summer, then I'll probably check out, do some cold water diving. Indo is supposed to open on the 2nd of June, or anyway, at least currently it's 2nd of June, or have you heard anything else? Yeah, no, I haven't heard anything else. My, I've been, I've been trying to look at flights, um, and, and that's kind of where the trick is. So uh, I think it's, it's preliminarily opening up the 1st of June. I hope they act, uh, if they actually do, the flight should pop up real quick. But right now, there's not that many options. Well, I hope you make it down there. I know you're, you're hurting for some dive time. <laughs> All right. Sitting so, way too long. Okay, so it's time to start. So I'm going to do the introduction first, and then I'm going to hand over to you. So uh, welcome everybody. We've got 67, well, over 60 people now already. Probably going to be a few more in the next couple of minutes. From all over the world, it seems we've got anyway the Americas, Europe, Africa, Asia. I haven't seen anybody from Australia, but uh, that's maybe because I overlooked it or if people didn't say hi. So we've got a super international crew. Um, we're here today to uh, listen to Phil. Phil is, like I said, the, uh, the tech insider, so for Insider Divers. Some of you guys don't know Insider Divers, so I'm going to just introduce us. Um, we are basically a company that does group trips. Uh, we do all kinds of scuba diving, both land-based and liveaboard, but we also do specific trips, for example, like a wreck itinerary in like Truck Lagoon, or trips which are for techs and Rex or just tech. So we do that as well, but it's always as a group. Uh, we also have free diving and snorkeling trips. So whales, uh, for example, is obviously uh, more of a snorkeling trip. So we do those as well. And then we have photography workshops. All of our trips are group trips. So that's what we do. We believe in that. And there's always at least one expert or insider uh, who's traveling with you. So for example, Phil as a tech instructor uh, will be there with you for a tech trip and make sure that the itinerary is perfect help to fine tune, make the planning. But also on a recreational trip, we always have at least one, like myself, instructor, photographer, or um, specific uh, knowledge people for the area to make sure that we offer something unique, something that is not so easy to arrange if you're not in group. And one thing we really focus on is always education and coaching. So even though we're having like fun trips, we always have talks about whatever, or we meet scientists, or we talk about you know how to improve your diving. And that is why in this period where we're all at home, uh, I started this thing which called, well, Insider Academy, sounds a bit fancy, but essentially it's a series of webinars because I think we're all stuck at home and everybody loves diving and we miss it. So we're bringing the ocean over to you guys. And today it's gonna be about tech diving. Um, so just in case this is the first time, if you go to our YouTube channel, there is actually all of the 20 odd uh, uh, webinars that we've already done about all kinds of topics. So please go check them out and subscribe. That would be awesome. Um, and then you can learn about sharks, manta rays, or photography, or, well, tomorrow we'll have a, a video with Phil about tech diving. So um, just before I give over to Phil, I just uh, wanted to uh, give you a couple of pointers with regards to Zoom, if this is your first time. Um, so I have turned off all the audio and video because for so many people, if somebody accidentally leaves the microphone on, then you just hear somebody breathing or burping or even worse. So that's why your audio and video is turned off, um, but you can use the chat and the Q&A. And because there's so many people, um, I'm going to manage that while Phil is talking. So that means I can sort it out a little bit if we've got overlapping questions. And if I feel like it fits right into his talk, then I'll ask him that specific question. But I'll also save up a lot of them to the end. Okay, so um, what I'd love is if you guys could put your like sort of general comments or whatever into the chat. And if you look in your panel, you can find a, a, a um, Q&A uh, field. And that's where I would like you to put questions. So questions that you would like answered. You can of course also put them in the chat, but then I might oversee them. So if you have specific questions that you would like answering, try to put them in the Q&A. Um, if I do activate your tone, I will ask you first, but we could do that in the end. Make sure you control your sound and turn it off again when you finish talking, because otherwise we can hear you. Um, so that is the plan. Without further ado, I would like to, whoops, I would like to hand over to Phil. Phil, welcome. Well, we've already did a little intro talk. Hey, guys. Um, 
So uh, do you want to take over the screen? Yeah, I'll uh, go. Let me see if I can get this screen. This will stop by the screen sharing. I'll share the screen. There we go. And then hopefully if I've got this right. You guys should see a blue page that says decompression yep. diving on that we looks right. Great. All right. Thank you, Simon. Okay, so just a little bit about me then. For those of you who don't know me or haven't met me yet, my name is Philip Christoph, and I am a TDI instructor trainer and instructor at Manta Dive in Gili Trawangan, Indonesia. And of course, I'd love to see any of you guys who want to want to come down and visit us. I've been with Manta for the last six years. I've been teaching for those six years. Uh, I've been tech diving for the last five and teaching tech uh, for the last four years. Um, so over the years, we've managed to do quite a few courses out of Manta and, and, and grow in our tech side. Um, a few years ago, I teamed up with Simon and I've run two trips with him now as an insider diver group leader to Truck Lagoon. Um, very much enjoyed that. We've had a blast. Looking forward to go, going again this year. Um, I'd also like to point out I'm, I'm an ambassador for uh, Fourth Element, Poseidon, Scuba Force, Nanite, and Paraland. So that's uh, full disclosure there. If you have any questions regarding equipment, those are my sponsors. So if I mention them, then you know that uh, I also have a bit of an interest in them. Um, also, I added my Instagram tag at the bottom. That's just so if you guys want to contact me after the webinar, if you have any questions, you can always reach me on Instagram or I can provide you with email or WhatsApp details, uh, and I'm happy to answer any of your questions. All right, so let's look a little bit at today's topic. So I'm gonna do a brief introduction to what is technical diving. So we're just gonna to touch on that for maybe the first 10 minutes of the presentation. Uh, I assume that most of you uh, are already certified divers, uh, maybe done your night trucks course, possibly your advanced course, um, and have a few dives under your belt. Uh, so that's gonna be kind of a starting point for this presentation as far as what I expect from your knowledge. Um, so I'll touch a bit on things you may have already seen as far as technical diving goes and hopefully put some of that into context. Uh, then I'll talk a little bit about why I choose to tech dive. And following that, we're gonna dig a little bit deeper and look a little bit closer at decompression diving. So I'm gonna start off with useful terminology because there's a few words that uh, I'll be using that might be new to you guys. And then we're gonna do a little workshop in a software called Multideco, which is a planning software. Uh, it's easily found online, I think it's 50 bucks, uh, where I'm gonna just kinda take you guys from a recreational dive like the kind you would have done on your open water course and bridge the gap over to what a technical or open ocean decompression dive is like so you guys can get a more practical feel for what that is and especially when we get to that point of the presentation ask questions if there's anything that i say that you don't understand or anything you need clarification with please let us know uh, i want it to be more of an interactive uh, webinar as we transition into that phase and then finally, I'm gonna be wrapping up with uh, what you can do if you wanna become a tech diver. And of course, we'll be happy to answer some questions there as well. I think we already had one that was quite interesting that I'll get to then. Um, and we have some exciting news for all the attendees here. Uh, there's a free online course we'll be offering at the end as well. Uh, and then we'll finish up with some Q&A. All right, so diving in, what is technical diving? Well. Uh, for many of you, you may have come in contact online with two of the more common categories of tech, which would be uh, overhead environments, wreck diving and cave diving. So wreck diving, specifically penetrating and entering the wrecks, limits your access to the surface, basically. So you lose your direct access to the surface. And that requires you to have a different skill set and potentially take some different equipment with you on a dive to be able to conduct the dive safely and minimize risk. Uh, cave diving has a lot of similarities with wreck diving in that sense that you don't have uh, direct access to the surface, uh, but because of the nature of the two environments, they require quite different courses because one being natural versus the other one being man-made. Okay, 
Um, the third, in a sense, overhead environment category would be decompression diving, all right? Now, the quote I put up here, every dive is a decompression dive. Um, the reason I put that up, it comes up in one of our early books, is that your body absorbs gas on every dive you go on. You, you descend, you go down, your body will absorb, uh, in this case, nitrogen if you're diving on air. And as you come up after a dive, that gas will slowly make its way out of your body. Um, that's the reason behind, for example, the no fly limits. So many of you might be familiar if you've been on a dive trip that you need to take the last 24 hours off before your flight. Well, that's because your body's still releasing gas that you absorbed on the dives, okay? Practically for us in tech, when we say a decompression dive, we're talking about a dive where you stay long enough on the bottom that you're going to have to make a few stops on the way up to the surface for the, some of this gas to leave your body so it's safe for you to surface. So when we talk about open ocean decompression diving, or if you added it onto the cave or wreck whenever you're decompression diving in those environments, um, you will have a series of stops you need to follow. And that's where we're gonna dig a little bit deeper uh, in this presentation and look at um, how one of those schedules could look and practically what we would do on a fairly entry level decompression dive, say on your, uh, on your first decompression course. Now, because of this scenario of having something above your head, so either that being something physical in a cave or a wreck, or what we call soft overhead, which would be uh, a depth limit that you're only allowed to go up to. Um, this takes away the idea that you can simply swim up to the surface in a worst case scenario. Many of you during your open water might have learned a swimming emergency ascent where you've, in the scenario, lost your buddy, uh, you're running low on gas, and so your best option is to head for the surface. Well, if you can't head for the surface, you need to have other options. And that option comes in the form of an additional tank. So visually, many of you have probably seen photos online of tech divers, and it looks like they're carrying a lot of gear. The fundamental start to that is often carrying that extra tank which is that backup gas. So looking a little at the different equipment setups you might have seen already, uh, on the left here, we have side mount. So in a side mount configuration, the diver carries at least one tank on each side, all right? Uh, both of those tanks would be filled with the same gas and you'd have one regulator attached to each. So the diver, oh, sorry, the diver switches back and forth. Uh, but that is one solution to the problem of carrying some extra gas with you. Uh, you may have also seen people diving in rebreathers. Now, uh, I'm a huge fan of rebreather diving. It takes quite a while to explain how a rebreather functions, so I'm not going to get into that in the detail here. We might run a, a rebreather webinar at some point where I, I really get into the details there and explain uh, how, how to get into rebreathers. But for now, let's just say it's a, it's a system we use underwater that recycles the gas that we're breathing. Uh, and then rebreather divers as a backup carry additional regular tanks to get themselves out of the water if the rebreather fails. Uh, finally, on the right there, you have a twin set. It's kind of hard to see because you can only see the right tank the diver's carrying, but it's basically two tanks next to each other carried on the back. In the end, you're solving the same kind of situation. We're trying to add an additional tank in case you were to run into any kind of trouble, uh, you have something you can switch to. So that's something you'll commonly see. And that's uh, both for decompression diving, for cave and wreck, some kind of backup system in terms of your air supply is very important to have with you. So um, moving on from that, do we, do we land on a definition? Well, I've thought about this for a long time and you could maybe list potential diving activities that would be considered tech, but the way I see it is you have systems. So you have a system for recreational diving where you have a single tank. Usually most people have a jacket style or wing BC. You have a primary regulator and you have an alternate. Um, and then of course, fins, mask, computer, and the rest of it. So that's your, 
you know, since recreational diving system that takes you through the activities that you do as you get through your recreational courses, whether it's the advanced, the rescue, photography, and so on. As you go into technical diving, we could say it's diving activities that require a system of equipment, skills, and knowledge beyond the scope of traditional recreational diving. Um, that line was drawn back in the uh, late 80s by the agencies. So basically, uh, Patty, SSI, and the rest of them had all developed a system of learning in courses they thought were appropriate. And at the time, the guys who were getting into these technical diving activities were considered to be a bit of cowboys, and many of them probably were. So they started their own agencies. And since then, it's all kind of mer starting to merge back together. Because in a sense, any diving activity we do that's for fun is recreational. So even the tech diving we do, we do it for fun. It's a, it's a recreational activity in that sense, all right? Um, and of course, things have gotten a little more complicated because more and more specialties and courses and fun stuff we can do underwater pops up and you see what category they kind of fall into. There are a few courses that bridge the gaps. Uh, but I think it's a, a healthy view to have is looking at it as a toolbox, all right? So if you arrive at a point where you want to achieve a goal, but the toolbox you've learned so far isn't sufficient in allowing you to achieve that, then you might want to look into some of the technical diving courses um, that, will, uh, that will allow you to get into the kind of diving activities that you want to do. All so right. one, one question I'm just going to ask here yes. was actually to the last Far one. Away. The, uh, somebody's asking a, a very regular question is, um, what is the difference between doing a tech course on twins or side mount? That's ah, okay. That's a, that's a great question. Twins were always the traditional way to go. Side mount came out of the, I uh, came out of cave diving and sump diving. So initially if you can imagine a diver, a diver carrying a twin set, uh, his BCD is attached to his tanks and his tanks are attached to each other. So you have this one big rig on your back. So some guys figured out that, well, that's not the handiest thing if you want to crawl through small spaces and caves. So they started making their own kit and eventually that built up into side mount. And a lot of people thought that's where it was going to end. Side mount would be this odd little specialty system for diving in small cave. Well, people who started diving side mount realized it was more comfortable and they enjoyed it more so then they brought that into open ocean and a lot of people find that uh side mounts in an easy kind of first step into into technical diving it teaches you uh the basic skill set and how to set up um set up your equipment with two tanks mounted along the sides uh it then caught a wave and since then it's been growing and growing. Uh, one of the big reasons I think for the popularity around Asia at least is side mount doesn't require the dive shop to have any specific type of tank. So the same tanks you would use for single tank dive, you can use them for side mount. Now, if the shop doesn't have side mount gear, you'd have to bring your own. When it comes to the twin sets, you connect the two tanks through the valve. So if you wanna dive on a twin set out of a dive shop, they actually have to provide manifolded twins. So that flexibility in being able to dive side mount at any dive shop I, and still get the benefits of carrying the extra gas, I think is one of the reasons that it shot up so much in popularity. Uh, the other being you're not carrying a fixed tank on your back, so you have more mobility in your back, so especially for photographers that like keeping their head up and arching their back. Um, they don't feel any resistance from the equipment keeps you quite stable as well for videography. So I think those are some of the reasons that side mount has, uh, has really seen a big upswing. And you know, we're, we're really happy for that. It's, it's good to see more people getting into the sport and the sport expanding. Uh, I hope that answered the question. So the, if, I, if I can add something to it, because I also just joined the side mount world last year. Um, even if you're doing a recreational dive, you're not uncomfortable despite having two tanks, whereas a twin is, is a bit uncomfortable because you know you, the, the manifold's behind your head. So you kind of dive in a setup that's non-technical. You can dive it just recreationally. But in my case, if you've got a really great situation, 
um, and you need more air because you want to stay longer, even shallow, then you've got that air. And like this winter in Raja Ampat, we had this dive was only at nine meters, but it was a super hard current and the manta rays were coming diving in. So I was kicking for like over an hour, 60 minutes, I was kicking against the currents. I used over 300 bar, but I could. I wasn't going into any dangerous decompression areas, but I just had more air for certain situations. And that is great. Like whenever you're diving side mount, you always have a spare air with you. And so I think that's another really great reason to dive side mount, even if you're not. Yeah, I think, I think what, what Simon's saying are also points to how there isn't really, they, they wanted us to, they wanted people to believe back in the day that there was a hard line. On one side, you have recreational. On the other side, you have technical. It's a spectrum. Uh, and where the actual line is drawn nowadays depends a little bit on the agency you choose. So it it more gets into the terms, but uh, we're seeing we're seeing a lot of knowledge from technical making its way down to recreational, and sometimes in the opposite direction as well. So um, there there's there's a wide spectrum of how you can move. Uh, I think one unfortunate misconception is that tech diving is only about extreme deep diving or extreme diving in general. It doesn't have to be that extreme, uh, as you'll see when we get into looking at some basic decompression plans. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and move All right, I'm going to ask on one more on question that, that just yep. came that's pretty good, I think, and it fits mm -hmm. into this topic. Dreyer is asking, um, would you comment about the use of back mount with two separate isolated regulators without using a manifold to connect the cylinders? Ah, yes. With, okay. So this is refer side mount, so you just, have just to mount. make just to clarify for the people out there. Normally, when we talk about twin sets nowadays, the tanks are connected at the top, and they each have their valve. So, to to make that easy to understand, that's like using one big tank that you can attach two first stages to. Okay. Uh, you can generally, there is a little valve you can isolate them with, but generally that's how that functions for you. You can breathe off one reg and it'll take air from both tanks. Um, the other version that he's talking about is independent double, where the two tanks on your back are not actually connected to each other. Um, that was a preferred system before they had the manifolds, but we've seen that phased out. It's not ideal. Uh, I would rather dive with the manifold because it gives me that ability to isolate. Uh, it, sorry, it, 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 I, I like the valve handling on it and um, I find the setup to be a bit more streamlined, but I understand that in certain places where you don't have access to manifolded twins, you could potentially opt for, uh, for independent doubles, but then you would need to have the rigging to be able to set that up and I won't go into too much detail, but there are a few tricks with reaching valves there that can get a bit complicated too. So, uh, but that gets, it'll, it'll be a bit too detailed and without actually having the gear to show you, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have to leave that for a later time. Uh, all right, so um, moving on. So why did I choose to tech dive and why do I continue to do it? Well, for me, diving was always about adventure. All right, and uh, very early in my diving career, I, I got into exploration and I wanted to kind of expand the dive sites that we were diving around the gillies. And I quickly got to a point where I realized that the knowledge I had and the equipment I had wasn't sufficient for the dives that I wanted to be doing. And then I met a tech instructor who introduced me to uh, some of the basic courses and started taking them. And I found it fun because it was challenging. It was something new to do underwater. Um, there were several very defined ways I could look at my diving and try to give myself feedback, get feedback from others, and, and expand my knowledge and skill set. And that led into more and more interesting exploration. And actually, I picked this particular photo because it was taken at a dive site called Linda's Reef. Uh, which has been maybe one of the greatest rewards out of all the exploration work we've been doing over the last three, four years around the Gillies. Um, it is a new wall we found in November that's uh, actually quite close to where, uh, quite close to the island compared to some of our other deep sites and has proven to be an amazing resource. We've, um, we have a gray reef population there, uh, the big school of surgeon fish that you can see in this photo. 
Uh, and uh, we're excited to see how that dive side performs over the year to see what different marine life show up there. But that's one of the big drives for me has been getting out there, exploring, and that just that feeling of not knowing what you're going to find. Uh, so that's really what's kind of tied me into that. That, and of course, the love love for teaching. And uh, I'm a bit of a gear nerd, so that helps as well, specifically in this sport. Um, all right, well, we're going to head towards the workshop portion of the webinar. Uh, first, I'm just going to go through a little glossary here of some terms for you guys, because uh, these will probably come up in one form of an, or another as we're playing around in multi deco. The first one being deco. When we talk about deco, quite often what we're referring to in a general sense is the part of the dive where a decompression diver is actually. Uh, decompressing. So you'll have your bottom phase of the dive where you're swimming on your wreck or your reef. And then as you start coming up and making stops on the way up, we would refer to that section of the dive as deco. Um, then second word on there, gas. Now this is something that quite often when you transition from recreational to tech gets people a bit confused. We keep calling it gas instead of air. Um, there is a bit of confusion as to what's actually in our tanks. Quite often, if you see an article in the media, they'll say something like oxygen tanks for regular scuba divers, which those of us who've done our courses know is in true, most basic courses start with air in the tanks. Now, in tech, we often involve nitrox all the way up to 100% and sometimes carry more than one gas on a diver, quite often do. Uh, so therefore, we use the term gas instead because it's not obvious what's in the tank. Uh, and when we talk about gas, we could talk about deco gas. This would be um, nitrox with high levels of oxygen that we use to shorten our decompression. Bottom gas, which could be air or nitrox that we use on the bottom phase. And then of course, gas switches, because if you're gonna be carrying multiple different gases on a dive, you're gonna need to learn how to switch between those gases. Um, Next word on there is profile, and that's basically just the shape of the dive you're doing. So uh, a classic when they, we teach tables at the base level is the square profile. A diver goes down, swims along at a given depth, and then comes back up. Versus say a multi-level profile, which would be a diver going down and then slowly working their way back up shallow. So those would be two examples of profiles. Now, the next one, stop sealing. Hopefully most of you guys are familiar with the safety stop. Uh, quite often people do three to five minutes at about five meters. Um, when we talk about decompression diving, we do, you can see it as we do several of these safety stops. The difference being a safety stop can be considered optional, especially on a really shallow dive. When we talk about decompression stops, they are mandatory in a sense. Uh, and quite often there's, uh, we do stops at more levels than just five meters. So we would say stop at uh, 12, at nine, at six, and then finish off at say about four and a half. Um, another term for this could be sealing. Uh, and that's back to this idea that you have something blocking your access to the surface. Um, on gassing and off gassing refers to your body absorbing the inert gas that's in your breathing mix. So in, for most cases, that's nitrogen. So your body is taking on nitrogen as you're on the bottom, that would be referred to as on gassing. And then as you start coming up and get shallower, you'll begin to off gas. And that, that is gas moving out of your body. This isn't something you specifically feel or notice, uh, which makes it a little bit mysterious in that sense, but it's something that we have models that we can use to attempt to track, okay? Uh, redundancy. Well, redundancy basically refers to backup. So you would say in, for example, a side mount system that you have a redundant gas supply because you have an additional tank, all right? And in this type of diving, because you don't have direct access to the surface, redundancy becomes very important. As well as the next word, contingency, which is another way of referring to the word backup. But in this case, we're talking about plans. So, for example, having a contingency plan, if you stayed a bit longer than you expected you were going to, or what you would do in, um, 
if you had a gas issue, so you were starting to run low. So different, different plans for what to do if things start going wrong on the dives. Uh, I've already touched a bit on soft overhead, but that's the idea. Hard overhead being cave or wreck, where you physically have something above your head. Soft overhead being decompression, where, I mean, physically, you could head straight up to the surface, but in the interest of your health and safety, um, you have these stops that you need to complete before, before you can return to the surface safely. Um, trim which would just be uh, the ideal body position, really. So we'd say good trim is a diver that's able to stay horizontal in the water, usually knees bent up as something you'll see quite commonly amongst people who are uh, doing tech dives. That's, uh, that's to get their feet away from the bottom in case they're in a tight space so they don't kick up any silt or sand that's on the bottom. Um, being in a horizontal position makes you more reactive in the water as well. It makes it easier for you to quickly move over to a buddy that's in need of help. Uh, it's also physiologically better. So if we're referring to trim, it's the body position we're talking about. Um, we might mention some streamlining. That has to do with how you manage the equipment, where you put it, such that um, you have the minimal risk of entanglement or getting stuck on anything. And at the basic tech level, it's quite easy because you're not carrying too many tanks and then as you progress and start carrying more equipment with you the streamlining process starts taking a little bit longer um, limiting factors uh, when we talk about limiting factors in terms of a decompression dive we're talking about either your access to equipment so do you have enough equipment to do the dive uh, do you have the right gases to do the dive um, what's the temperature like so your exposure protection uh, we may all, I remember one of my first dives I did with a new wetsuit I bought was in 19 degree water. And even though I had enough gas to stay down for uh, 40 minutes and uh, there was no other, nothing else affecting me, I got cold enough after 10 that I didn't want to be down there anymore. And it was thankfully just a basic recreational dive so I could come back up. Uh, but yeah, limiting factors could be temperature, uh, time regarding the boat, gas, equipment all the things that limit the duration of the dive. Uh, finally, conservatism. Um, I'm not gonna get into too much detail on different computers, but uh, most of you guys have probably dived with a computer or seen tables. Um, they will give you a given amount of time for a depth to stay down. You'd know, know about that as your no decompression limit. Now, some computers will allow you longer at a depth, some computers will allow you shorter. That's the way of the people who've designed the computer to manage risk. So staying shorter durations would be more conservative, longer durations at a depth, if you're doing no decompression diving, would be less conservative. Um, but we're not gonna dig too deep into conservatism on this particular topic. So without further ado, I'm gonna attempt a screen switch here and we're gonna jump into multi deco and before i get started here simon do we have any more questions coming through anything on that glossary are we still good yeah no i'm i'm saving some for the end um so we're, we're gonna have some questions that are gonna be across the board um so we'll just keep going for now. good all right so guys welcome to multi deco now i know there's a lot going on on the screen here um and most of the things that you're seeing, you're not going to have to worry about. We're going to be playing in a few little areas. So over here on the left, you see it's written out bottom mix and travel, depth and time. So what we do in this space over here is we can play with different levels and times we want to do. So if we just double click this first one I have here. What it is is saying that we're looking at a depth of 18 meters. We're looking at a time of 30 minutes and we're looking at a oxygen percentage of 21. So this would be regular old air, okay? So these are three pieces of information I'm telling the computer. So I'm saying, I wanna go on a dive to 18 meters. I wanna spend 30 minutes on the bottom and I'm gonna be diving on air, okay? Um, what this software does is it models what my dive computer would do if I attempted this dive. So I'll just hit calc, but it should already be up. It then generates this section that we have here. 
So initially you have the level that I put in the 30 minutes at 18 meters. Oh, sorry, let's get rid of that. There we go. Then it has an ascent to six meters where it's asking me to do a one minute stop. So in this case, this is a pretty basic recreational dive. You could see that as your safety stop. We won't worry about any of these O2U CNS just yet. We'll look a little bit at this gas section, but to give you a better understanding of that table, there's a different view here. Yeah, there we go. So this might be a view that you're more familiar with. Here you have your, uh, your depth and time, and this is showing you the profile of the dive that I selected. So I'm starting off with this um, 30 minutes at 18 meter profile, uh, because this is a dive that would be similar to something you probably did on your open water course, all right? So, um, a simple 30 minute bottom time at 18 would be within the no decompression limits. Everything should look quite familiar. Well, say that our diver who's done his open water and then gone on and does his advanced has uh, a wreck or a reef at 30 meters that they wanna dive and they would like to spend the same amount of time there. So I'm going to select a 30 meter level for half an hour on air. And then I'm gonna hit my, oops, Hit my calculate button here to see what the software generates. Well, here we have a level, 30 meters for 30 minutes. And then the software is telling me I'm gonna have to stop at 12 meters for a minute. And then again, I'm gonna have to make a stop at nine meters for a minute. And finally, I'm gonna have to stop at six meters for 26 minutes. So I've told the software I wanna do this, and it has said that I'm gonna be required to do these stops. Now. Hopefully, if you're not a tech diver already, you haven't been violating your no decompression limits, um, but this is where your computer would go into deco as you pass your, uh, as you pass that no decompression limit, okay? And depending on what computer you have or if you're, you're diving off of tables, for the computers, you would have a different view once you get into deco. The computer would start communicating this information. So my computer would, for example, say, you can go up to 12 meters, so it'll tell me that's my ceiling or my first stop, and it'll say that I should stay there for a minute, okay? So if we go back to our profile view and have a look at this dive, um, this is starting to look more towards what we would expect a decompression dive to look like. So we have a phase that is our bottom phase, where we're swimming around enjoying the dive, practicing skills or doing photography or whatever it is we're doing, and then we have a section at the end of the dive that requires some decompression, the stop at 12, the stop at nine, and then our final stop at six. So most of you guys who've done dives in the range to 30 meters, you could probably get away with spending 30, 30, 40 minutes underwater if you start shallowing off earlier, but actually getting a full half hour down there would take you into deco. Now, for that half hour, this may seem like quite a lot of deco, spending 26 minutes at your safety stop, and we came up with a solution for that. So, when I was saying earlier that we use deco gas, by using a second gas, a gas we can switch to. Sorry, Sorry. So yes. let's just let's make sure we, because people can't really reply, you know, make sure that everybody's on board. So, yes. um, I'm just going to repeat and you correct me yeah? so yes. we normally normally when we would go to 18 meters that was the first simulation yes. our computer and our paddy tables they would let us dive half an hour at 80 18 meters Perfect. without problems and that's what yes. your program here was confirming right yes. so that was the first dive we talked about mm -hmm. the second dive is if we go to 30 meters normally our like suntos and you know all the recreational computers will give us 17 18 minutes max and this yes. is where you entered into the tech zone, essentially, right? Yeah. Right. That, as soon as you go longer than those 17 minutes before we hit no deco on a recreational computer, that is all still like recreational. It, yeah. Tech becomes that minute 18 or whatever. That's when it becomes. Yeah. As you start, as you start moving into decompression, so. You can look at it at, back to that uh, kind of uh, system or uh, tool set um, point of view. Uh, it's, it's not specifically that you're chasing, chasing depth, but rather in this case, say we have a wreck at 30 meters, 
and it's going to take 30 minutes to get a good view of the whole wreck, then you might want to move into a plan where you can spend those 30 minutes there. Uh, and those 30 minutes come at a cost. And in this case, that cost is about 30 minutes of deco or 30 minutes of decompression. You have two one minute stops and then you have this longer 26 minute stop there. Show the graph one more time? Sorry? Show the graph one more time? Yes, absolutely. All right, so back to here's our 30 minutes on the bottom. And then roughly we have our half hour of decompression that we've racked up here, most of that at six meters. Now, the reason the decompression is as long as it is in this case is your body's absorbed nitrogen, you're breathing air, air has quite a lot of nitrogen in it. So when you breathe air at your last, at your stop, it takes quite a while for the nitrogen to get out of the body because there's quite a lot of nitrogen in the breathing mix you're using. So people start experimenting with using decompression gases. So over here in this column, I can put in potential deco gases. Now I've just selected 80% because it's a common mix we use and we're gonna keep it to one single deco mix for this presentation. So let's have a look at what happens if I select that 80%. Now what I've told the, all I'm telling the software here is I'm gonna be carrying this gas so I could potentially switch to it um, for the decompression phase of the dive. I want you guys to look at this particular section here. We have a total dive time of 62 minutes and we have a last stop of 26. That's where we're at if we just take air with us. Now, when I hit calculate here, oh, the menu's in the way. There we go. When I hit calculate here, we're gonna see what happens if I bring in 80% with me. And there we go. So we still have our one minute stop at 12 and one at nine, but our last stop is now eight minutes instead of 26. And the total dive time is now 44 minutes. So we have significantly shortened the deco phase of the dive. All right, so our penalty for this half hour at 30 meters is now about 10 minutes of deco. Um, 10 minutes that could pass pretty quickly. Uh, so all of a sudden that penalty doesn't seem as high anymore. So this is why we carry that, that would be our say third tank, that nitrox 80. It's to shorten the decompression down, get us out of the water quicker. Uh, the longer we stay in the water, the more fatigued we get. So especially as we build up to more complex dives, being efficient and getting out of the water quicker becomes important. So just to backtrack a little, we had a 30 meter dive without the 80%, resulting in a total time of about an hour. And now using the 80%, we got it down to 44 minutes. All right. Um, now, yeah, we'll look, at the, we'll look at the graph if we shorten that down. Now, I just want to make one note here before I continue any further. These, these examples that I'm giving are just examples, okay? There's a lot that goes into setting up the configuration for a software like this so that it actually matches what you're going to experience in the water. So please do not take these plans out and go dive them. This is just a visual representation of what technical diving is. You need the training. <laughs> so come and see me if you actually want to try and execute something like this. Okay, uh, multi-deco multi -deco has its own little warning. And I think one of my favorites is the first line here, this multi-deco generated dive schedule could indirectly kill you. So you want to be a bit careful, all right? You don't just jump into a planning software, type something in, think it looks fine, and then go out and test it out. This is something we build up to as we do our training, but it's also a great way for me to show you what some of our dives would look like. So back to our 30 meter dive here with our Nitrox 80, we've reduced the decompression to a more manageable level. And now I think we're gonna move on to our third level, wait, which wait. I've put in here. Yep, go ahead. Uh, just for visualization purposes, this is now a three tank dive. Right, you might want to just yes. say how the eighty percent and the other. Yeah. yeah, we're assuming that for the bottom phase of the dive, you were using either a side mount or a twin set system. Uh, in this case, because of the need to have backup gas, we can also look. The software here will tell you how much of each gas you're going to use. So here it says it's using one thousand nine hundred liters of air, roughly, and two thousand two hundred liters of nitrox eighty. Now, to put that into perspective. The most common size single tank, so what you would see at normal dive shops around the world, 
will hold, when it's full, 2,200 liters. So we are just below using a full tank of air uh, with the breathing rate that I'm using for this, um, this particular example. Now, just like when you dive recreationally, you have a limit that you say, all right, well, I'm not gonna let my tank, tank pressure go below 50 bar. I wanna surface with 50 bar. I wanna surface with 60 or 70. The same way we need to have a reserve capacity when we tech dive as well. So this would not be a sufficient amount if we carried a single tank and we wanted to have a reserve. So that second tank is not only there to help us out because we don't have direct access to the surface, we're also gonna need that additional gas. And as you see, when we move from 30 to 40 meters, um, we're gonna need even more. Um, so we can go ahead and see what this would look like. Now, most people, if you've done a recreational 40 meter course, the deep specialty with either SSI or or Patty, excuse me. Um, one of the things people find is you get down there, you do a quick narcosis test at 40, you have a look around and you're on your way up again. So yes, you can be certified to 40 meters, but with most tables and computers, you're not gonna get much more than five minutes at that depth. So it's often a quick look around and then most of that dive is spent shallower. Um, and that's really where it got me that I, I wanted to spend more time there because I didn't find that five to 10 minutes was enough time to really accomplish much. So let's look at what it would take to do a 40 meter dive for half an hour. Uh, we'll start off without the decompression gas and then we'll see the difference it makes when you have the deco gas. All so air, count, right? All air. All, yeah. So far, we're just on air. Uh, we'll just be using air in this 80% for this wor little workshop because I don't want to involve other nitrox mixes to make it more complicated. But We'll start off, maybe we'll start off with our profile view first here. Here's our 40 meter dive. So um, as you can see, the blue section has become a little bit shorter and that's mainly because the red section is longer. We're now looking at a 104 minute dive. We have our nice half hour on the bottom. We come up, there's a stop at, I think it's 15, 12, nine and six. So now the deco portion of the dive is eating up a large portion, but we're able to do our 30 minutes on the bottom. To be able to do something like that, you would need, as you can see, more than two full tanks with you. And a lot of that consumption is coming because if we look over here, that last stop at six meters is 58 minutes long. Uh, for those of you looking at this table here, this is of course your depth and then the time spent at the stop in the middle. Uh, you don't have to worry about this one, it's just adding up the times. We call it run time, but we'll leave that for now. But this kind of ties into um, a lot of people say, well, isn't it boring to sit on deco? Don't you guys get bored just hanging around? And I think that's a misconception of the cost, for the benefit versus reward of these kind of dives. So half an hour at 40 meters could be quite an awesome time. And I'll show you now, once we involve the deco mix, that the price you pay for that isn't necessarily that high. So with our 80%, we can shave that last stop down to 16 minutes. And our dive time total is about an hour. So if we go back over to our profile view, this is starting to look very manageable. And to, to get the chance to spend four, 30 minutes at 40 meters exploring a reef, and trust me, if you're in most areas, after the first three, four minutes, you have the place to yourself. Um, spending 25 minutes on deco, actually goes pretty quickly because you, you start off with an SMB deployment somewhere here, you'd be shallowing off. The first stops are so short that they go quite quick and you don't really settle in until you get to that last stop, okay? So uh, time actually goes pretty quickly. It's not that you, you rarely would find yourself in a position there feeling bored or needing something to do. Of course, occasionally, if you have longer deco, photographers take the opportunity to look through the photos they got. But until you get to the really big dives, I would say something like this time will fly and it's over before, before you know it. So this profile that we're looking here at here is a pretty good example of the kind of dive we would be doing on an entry level decompression uh, course. And actually, the selected levels I have match up 
with the dives that we'd normally do. So on, on the first course teaching Dika, we would start off with an 18 meter dive or a 15 meter dive to practice skills, get used to the equipment and uh, the skills and procedures. Then we would move on to a 30 meter dive that obviously did not incur so much of a deco penalty, um, where we'd practice a bit more and get a better feel. And finally moving on to the 40 meter level or 45 meter level, where we would do a more standard, I guess, 40 meter decompression dive uh, for a three tank setup. And that's where we arrived here. So looking at this profile, I'll just go through it briefly with some of the things that we would do on a dive like this to give you an idea of some of our skills and procedures. We'd normally do a back roll entry if we were diving out of, out of Manta. Which, by the way, shout out to the Manta crew. Um, you would meet with your buddy on the way down at about five meters where you do a final equipment check uh before you go any further so the dive groups usually face off buddy in buddy teams you check that the equipment's okay the descent continues uh, another quick go no go is done just as you're about to arrive at the bottom and then the divers level off now for the bottom phase usually you can choose to practice some skills or you're just doing it for fun just swimming around looking for sharks and fish and whatever it is you'd like um, and then as we're approaching the end of the bottom phase, because as you can imagine with this schedule, it's quite important for us to stay on time. Um, so with a little bit of uh, wiggle room, we leave the bottom a little earlier and start making our way up to doing these stops. And then if people need to put up a surface marker, they do. Um, we work our way through the first shorter stops and eventually get to the point where we do our gas switch. And we have our, I'm not gonna go into it now, but we have procedures for how you should do that as well to do that safely. But basically this is the anatomy of quite a basic entry level tech dive, okay? Uh, we have our um, descent and bottom phase, and then we have a deco phase that balance out the roughly about the same amount of time. Now. This software gets very complex. We could go into doing 100 meter dives, uh, 15 different gas mixes if we wanted to fiddle. You can go as crazy as you'd like, but really this is where we start off with the basics. You have uh, three tanks with you. Two of them have your bottom mix. One of them has your deco mix. Uh, you're, doing, you're doing a phase, a single level bottom, and then you have a few levels to do on decompression. Let's see, in this case it was one, two, three, four decompression levels, a one minute stop at 15, a four minute stop at 12, a four minute stop at nine, and a 16 minute stop at six. Um, and as I said earlier, this is just a sample profile. I don't, I'm not recommending anybody go out and dive this particular one without uh, more training and in-depth planning because there's a lot of el other elements here that I have not covered. But just to give you an idea of what it could look like, um, finishing off with our profile here. This is what a pretty standard entry level tech dive could look like, or one of the dives on the Rexon truck. Um, before I head back to PowerPoint, are there any, um, any other questions coming through there, Simon? Yeah, we've got a lot of questions, but they're kind of all over. I'm gonna ask some questions that I think fits here. So you mentioned when people do the course with you. Um, yes. By the way, for everybody who's wondering how to book a course, I'm gonna share, um, I'm going to share your email address afterwards and also Menta Dive is the shop where he works. So I'm going to share all of this in the wrap up email that I'm going to send later to everybody. So don't worry about that. But so if somebody is doing this course, the tech, the entry level tech course, how many days do they need to plan? And uh, uh, well, uh, I'm, I'm going to get into the specific courses. Oh. I have that listed uh, listed later. I was thinking, do we have any more specific questions related to um, related to planning? Yeah, we have like, some people are saying, what about nitrox? And so you okay, so let's just let's let's entertain one. that for a second, just to, for those, because I know if we lose a few people right here, just for a second, I, I apologize, but let's look at our 30 meter dive here with the 80. So now we had our um, 30 minutes at 30 meters. Um, you'd stop for one minute at 12, one at nine, and then at six meters for eight. So good point what if we use nitrox instead so for 30 meters we could use a nitrox 32 and that might actually push this to the brink of almost not being a decompression dive anymore 
Yeah, it gives us a three minute stop. Um, so yeah, you can, you can obviously, you could use nitrox to reduce, to extend your bottom time, your no deco bottom time and reduce the amount of decompression. What gets tricky, I'm just gonna switch this back real quick, is as you start going deeper, those of you who may have taken your nitrox courses, the deeper you go, the lesser the oxygen percentage. So as we arrive at 40 meters, the max we could use would then be a 28, and at 45, we get down to a 25. So for the simplicity, just to be able to compare all these different levels, I stuck with air. But we do use nitrox as well. We could just quickly show that 40 meter dive. If we switch that to a 28% and run that one again, yeah, you're looking at a 53 minute dive. So we shaved um, seven, eight minutes off that dive. Um, so we do, we do incorporate nitrox as bottom mixes. I kept it at air just for the simplicity of the presentation, but this, I hope this uh, gave a little bit of clarification on that. Um, I think uh, um, I'm gonna ask two more questions here that fit into here. Uh, one is, um, um, if you remain, at 40 meters, do you increase your risk for gas narcosis significantly? Oh, good question. Um, so narcosis for me is always taken on kind of, there, there, there's, there's the narcosis you experience on a recreational dive and the narcosis you experience on a technical dive and they are a little bit different. Um, I wouldn't say, I mean, it varies from day to day, but if you did a bounce dive to 40 meters, so you went down to 40, you stayed for a very short period of time, and then you started coming back up, you might feel a sudden onset of narcosis, but then you'll also feel it dissipate pretty quickly as you start shallowing off. What happens when you stay 30 minutes at 40 meters is you settle into it. So it tends, you you do feel it, you'd feel it the same way you would if you went down for a shorter period of time. But the kicker is it doesn't just disappear as you start coming up, it hangs with you a little bit longer, okay? I wouldn't say that it intensifies during the time you spend at depth, but that's a factor of what you're doing as well. Um, narcosis, is it in, because it impairs you, uh, we often compare it to alcohol consumption. So somebody who's consumed a bit of alcohol, they're not gonna struggle so much with a simple task, but if you give them complex tasks, they're gonna have bigger problems. Same thing with narcosis. So if you're spending half an hour at 40 meters and you're doing, say, a, a more advanced skill, practicing that down there, you'll probably notice the effects a lot more. You're, you're affected the same, but depending on what you're trying to do down there, you will, you will feel it more when you try to do something more complex or if you try to think. That's why often narcosis tests involve some kind of problem for you to mentally overcome at depth to see how your mental uh, faculties are. I believe the Navy used tying a knot. Uh, they'd make sure the diver was proficient on the surface and then they would see how much longer it would take them to do it at depth. So there is a um, alcohol because like, that's what I would have said, but I didn't know that you as an instructor would choose that, but it's like, you know, when you have like your three beers, so it's the most common, it's, it's the most more, right? You have to concentrate a bit more than, than if you had no beers, right? Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Well, it's uh, well, one of the analogies I always draw is things that you practice well, you'll be able to do with a minor level of narcosis. Now I'm not advocating for very high levels of narcosis, air diving beyond, we, we teach air to 55 and we'll see if that'll continue, but that's definitely on the upper end of how narc do you wanna be underwater. More than that, we use, we start incorporating helium, which removes the narcosis. But one of the th examples I point to is, you'll see people go out on a good night out on the town, no matter how much they drink, they seem to always be able to find their way home. Uh, and the reason being it's something, it's an activity they've done so many times that it's kind of ingrained in their system. But if you try to give them directions to a new location, there's no chance they would make it. So by practicing skills and procedures shallow and getting to the point where they're reflexes, where they're kind of ingrained in you, then when, you're, when it calls upon you to use them and you're experiencing some narcosis, you have the best chance of performing successfully. So we, basically we do, we do shallow practice to be able to handle the trouble that we would then potentially get into deep. So I'm, uh, I'm just gonna relate to that and then add another question in here because I think that's pretty good. So uh, like you said, you find your way home. I always find that you know, you, 
when you expose yourself to something and you're familiar with it, you're able to deal with it. So when you knock the first time at 40 meters, it's totally different when you've done it 10 times, 20 times, and so on. Right now, I can feel still pretty comfortable at 50 meters. And at 55, I really got to like concentrate. And I can tell to hear and no further. But I'm sure if I would do that 100 more times, then I would also get more comfortable with, the, with well, that. You get lulled that. into a false sense of security there is what's happening. Is it your, so your, your, ability, your ability to, to deal with the feeling of narcosis is not the same as your ability to perform while being narked. And, and that's unfortunately a risk zone that a lot of, I, I see a lot of divers go into. They think because they're so used to getting narcosis that they would still be able to perform well when they're narked. Now, the only way to make sure that you're gonna perform well is to practice skills over and over again. So I'll give an example. An example would be dropping and retrieving one of your cylinders. So this is something you might give somebody a tank of air in case they needed it at depth, but it's, it's a fundamental skill to be able to take one of your cylinders off, drop it, and then pick it back up again. Now, if you practice this shallow, and did it say 50, 60 times, you'd be so proficient and have the muscle memory in that if you tried to do that while you were narked, you probably have a pretty high chance of success. Now, if you have another diver who hasn't been practicing dropping and retrieving a tank much shallow, but they're very accustomed to the narcosis, that won't necessarily help them that much because they'll struggle because they don't have that muscle memory in and their brain is gonna have to think to try to put their hand in the right place. And if they encounter any kind of hiccup along the way and their brain has to think on the fly, all of a sudden that comfort with the narcosis can go away pretty quickly. So that's what I mean by a false sense of security. Um, you don't want to dive to a depth where you're impaired and you don't feel like you'd be able to, to handle the skills that are required of you. But a big part of it is you need to practice, you practice skills shallow and you do them under non-stressful conditions to build up muscle memory. Just like with any sport, your body will eventually start remembering movements and you'll be able to, for example, reach for pieces of equipment or find things without thinking about doing it. And that, that's, that's what we aim for. And of course, we can't get there on the first course. We provide you with the toolkit and we get your skill level to a certain point. But one of the parts of being a tech diver is it's unexpected of you to continue practicing these skills uh, and keeping them, you need to be a well-oiled machine. Um, and of course, I mean, if, the, if, if narcosis is something you don't want, there's always the option of putting some helium in the mix and reducing the narcosis. Um, in cave diving and wreck diving, it's quite common that people do this from 30 meters and deeper, especially, um, especially in cave because uh, the dives get complex enough that you don't need narcosis to be a factor as well. So I'm going to throw in a question, but before I do that, um, yes. guys, I know we've reached the full hour. Um, I apologize. Um, we are going to continue uh, a little bit longer. Um, if you can't stay with us, it's all going to be recorded. It's going to be on YouTube and Facebook, um, but we are going to get soon to the questions that everybody asks. So apologies if it takes a bit more Maybe time. Maybe should, should I jump on to the uh, next PowerPoint? Let me just keep that one question because I think it fit pretty well that I've heard before. Ixan asked earlier if tech diving requires calm water and what happens if you suddenly have currents? Like does that Ooh, I like that. Hurt? That's, uh, that's a very, very good question. So there's definitely a category of conditions that would be safe for a recreational dive, but not safe for a technical dive. And uh, if we go back to, let me just switch this back to what we had it. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about currents and waves and conditions. So if we go to our profile here, because this is one of the things we were looking at doing some technical diving down in Limbongan. For those of you who know it, that's off the coast of Bali. The bottom phase is one thing. Now, at 40 meters, you, you can't swim at the same speed you would at 18 without seriously feeling effects from it because of gas density and because of the narcosis. So we move less the deeper we go, all right? Um, and we, we need to be calmer the deeper we go. So for the bottom phase, it'll have some implications. Obviously, you want to be you want to be careful. But then the question is, what's going to happen as we start coming up here? And that's where you run into trouble if you have very aggressive surface conditions, and you know you're going to have to spend 25 minutes at 
shallow or depths hanging, if there are multiple dive groups in the water, and that would involve you drifting, because quite often when you're doing this kind of decompression where we are, we do it in the blue, um, you may drift quite far away from the original point. Now, if you're the only group in and the boat can follow you, that's fine. But if you're not, then that's not necessarily an option. So those so conditions will definitely dictate, and um, we have to be a bit more careful. Now, we generally dive on known dive sites where we know the conditions, we know the currents. Uh, truck's a perfect example of that. Uh, the conditions are about as favorable as they could be. So when we go there, we have a very easy time. We have lines tied off to the wrecks that we can go up. There's almost no current. Visibility is excellent. Temperature is good. But um, when we dive around Indonesia, where we are uh, around, especially from even from diving out of Manta, uh, we have certain dive sites that are generally quite calm and easy to dive and others where we really have to be careful with the currents before we jump in the water and also read them, of course. We, we're actively reassessing the environmental conditions as we dive as well. So sometimes it might be prudent to call a dive early because you feel like uh, environmental conditions might cause trouble for you later on. I let's, hope go that to your, um, let's go to your wrap-up slides because we've yes. got quite a few questions I would like to go through with you. Yeah, all right. Well, there's not that much left. So I had one slide here on why you should tech dive. So a few of the different reasons. Uh, as you might have seen from these profiles that we showed, for a lot of people, it's about time. It's not so much about depth. It's about getting that extra time at 30 meters or extra time at 40 meters. And I, I know I'm referencing truck a lot, but with the wrecks, that makes a big difference. A lot of the a lot of the diving we do isn't necessarily ridiculously deep. It's a lot of 25 to say 45 meter dives. Um, but in that section, we're getting significantly longer times, and, and and that's really one of the big things for people. For some, it is depth, and of course, there are areas like the San Francisco Maru that was mentioned earlier, or some of our deep reefs start at 45, 35 meters. And if you want to explore those, of course, then um, then getting the technical training will will help you get there. Uh, just to give you guys some perspective on depth, usually the start off point is a 40 to 45 meter course. Then from there, it goes to a 55 to 60 meter level. So that would be say level two. And then it moves up towards 80 to 100 meters. So it's not like there's 17 different levels to get deeper. There's about, I would say there are about three to four depth categories. Um, then you have, of course, wrecks and caves, which I've mentioned earlier. They're amazing. I did my cave in, in Florida, about four hours from where I'm sitting now. Um, and I love both wreck and cave diving. Uh, for photography, uh, it might be that extra time um, that you want to be able to document a species or a wreck. Um, for exploration, tech comes really in handy. It, handy it, it, the toolbox that it gives you to, to, to really push exploration. Um, sometimes conservation as well. And that's something we're seeing more coming up now and is actually something that's really exciting for me. Um, quite often, you've probably seen little reef rebuild projects, uh, artificial reefs. What we've been doing on the conservation side is more cleanup lately, a lot of pulling of nets off of the deeper reefs, but it also gives us an insight into what's going on at the deeper reefs around our, our little islands. Um, trash, uh, the, the sharks that we see down there, the marine life. So it gives us more insight into what's going on with the ocean around us. Uh, and finally, I put down it's awesome because there, there's an X factor to all of this. And uh, there, there's, something, there's something special about joining the tech diving community and um, getting out on these dives. There's a, there is, I know, there's a bit of a sense of accomplishment when you first start out when you're, when you're doing these dives because of, you learn what, all the things that it takes from you to get into it. So it, it's, it's a special feeling. It's something it's hard to put your finger on. Now, I'm going to add, add one thing. Can I yes. add one thing? Of course. So um, I totally agree with all of these. And for me, because I'm at, you know, at heart, I'm a photographer. And for me, the extension of the dive time is definitely the most exciting thing that you can just spend more time. Like we had this in Raja Ampat this year with the mobile arrays hunting. You know, they were hunting the sardines and it just, they don't do that right in front of you. So you just have to wait. And so the ability to make a decompression later at a shallower area is just really amazing time. But I have to say one thing that I can just recommend to everybody, because essentially we, this is a sport that is 
it, it comes with dangers. And if we do, you know, our open water advance in the first year, maybe we'll do a rescue, but then people are like, no, I don't want to work. I don't want to become a dive master. I think you should do something every year or two. And when you run out, even if you're an instructor and you've been five years an instructor, you haven't done anything anymore. A tech dive, a tech course really makes you understand the whole thing again, better and deeper. You understand what's behind, you know, the whole knowledge in diving. So like just the aspect of understanding scuba diving, I think that's a great reason to do tech diving because you just understand why Patty does it in this way, why TDIS is I, uh, do the things that they make open water students do, you suddenly understand the, the actual principles behind why you're not allowed to do more than so and so many minutes. I think that's a great reason um, to go to tech as well. Sorry. Yeah, I think you touched on something important there. The, every, every skill that we teach on these, like on the, on the entry level courses, I'll give the side mount advanced nitrox decompression procedures. Oh, spell a mistake. Um, the, the skills that we learn on these courses, you'll find that you use them quite quickly. I've used pretty much every skill I've had to learn. Uh, so the toolkit, because there's more to it, the toolkit has been narrowed down and fine tuned a bit more, I would say. Um, and the no background knowledge you get to a lot of the practices you, you might already be doing in your diving, it, it sheds a lot of light on that. So if you wanted to get started, I want to talk just very briefly a little bit about prerequisites, where you would need to be as a diver to maybe consider one of these courses. Now, I would say if you have in the 25 to 50 dive range, you've done up to your advanced, maybe your rescue, that's a perfectly good starting point to do, for example, intro to tech or side mount. Now, intro to tech is basically a course on how to use twin sets and introduces some technical skill sets. So these two courses are quite similar to each other. Uh, even though they have, um, even though it's not called a twin set course. And TDI actually, or, I just... Sorry, is this sorry? TDI or which... This which is agency? TDI, yes. But most most agencies will have uh, an um, a, a intro to tech course of some sort. Uh, different agencies break it up differently. And I understand that that's a space that can be a little bit difficult to navigate. I've chosen to, to work through TDI because I, I like their theory. I like the way the courses are set up and I have a very good relationship with those guys. They're, they're fantastic. And actually just before we started this, I, I managed to edit that in. Uh, TDI is offering the online theory for intro to tech for free. So I believe I've sent a link to Simon. He's going to put that in the email. So any of you who want to, that's normally, I think 35, 40 or 50 Singapore dollars. You can get on that intro to tech course online on tdi.com and that'll take you through a few chapters that'll um that'll touch on a lot of the things i spoke about today so that's a very good starting point if you're interested in getting a feel for what the theory is going to be like so most people will start here with either intro to tech or side mount depending on if they want to be on twins or side mount but i definitely recommend this theory even if you're not planning on doing much diving on twins intro to tech could be quite useful because it's basically a shortened version of what you learn in decompression procedures and more advanced nitrox. Now, these two courses here are kind of standalone. Side mounts an equipment course, um, and intro to tech is a bit of a teaser and a twin set course. Advanced nitrox is what you're gonna need to have to be able to use the deco mixes. So we, in the example that we were looking at, we used an 80%. Well, as you might know, basic nitrox takes you up to 40%. So if you want to use more than 40% in a gas mix, you need to do what's called advanced nitrox. And it touches more on the fact that these high oxygen mixes are more often used for decompression. All right, so the use is a little bit different. Uh, the handling may be a little bit different. Most of the calculations and formulas are the same. Um, there's a more in-depth look at physiology and how the body reacts with gas mixes. So that's your advanced nitrox course. Uh, and that's generally coupled with decompression procedures. And decompression procedures is the course that uh, teaches you to do these stage decompressions. So we had our, um, our example of our 40 meter dive. Uh, it'll cover the physiological considerations, the physics considerations, problem solving and equipment, how to plan the dive, how to execute it, um, and it goes quite into depth on all of those. Now, generally, um, advanced nitrox and deco, when you do them combined, is a six-day course. Uh, at Manta, we do six dives. 
Uh, if we need more dives, we add, we just tack them on at the end. Um, for the side mount intro tech courses, they're two day courses that we do three dives on. But same thing there. It's not so much about getting a specific number. It's about getting you guys or the people who are doing the course to a point where they're comfortable and confident and their skill level is where it needs to be. Um, and then I added just a touch here. If somebody's really interested in rebreathers, they should know there is a try rebreather. It's a one day kind of rebreather DSD where you do a morning theory and pool session with, uh, with your instructor. And then in the afternoon, you go on a very shallow nine meter dive just to get a feel for what it's like to be underwater on a rebreather. So that's also a course that's open to somebody yeah, say 25 to 50 dives, advanced rescue or DMs or instructors out there. Um, and then you can, if that's something that interests you, we can start discussing further what the right path is to take there. But I would say, um, and a lot of people contact me and they're worried they're not experienced enough to get started with these basic courses here. And what I want to say is if you're already over 100 dives, tacking on another 100 dives on a single tank you're, you're, you're reaching slightly diminishing levels of return, I would say, on the new that you're picking up. You're better off jumping into side mount, giving it a try, and then improve, and then doing the dives after you've gotten that certification and actually build some experience on that equipment setup. Uh, and I, I mean, there's a lot of perfectionists out there. I know a lot of people want to come in with this as 100% as well prepared as possible, but it's going to be a learning experience. So mistakes will be made, all right? We, uh, and you'll be remolded a little bit. Uh, but just to recap that, we have our intro to tech and side mount could be a good starting point for people. You do have the option to go straight into advanced nitrox and decompression procedures, uh, but uh, I would recommend taking one of these two first. And then of course okay. we have the try CCR as well. I'm gonna just move to the question. Oops. Looks like something's gone wrong. The question slide, and then we can start ticking them off one by one. So I'm going to start with combining a couple of questions in terms of uh, recommendations for gear. Um, if yes. There was a dive computer question, and mm -hmm. also just generally what's in terms of budget a good uh, sort of what you say is an investment that's worth your while if you want to slowly get into tech. Yeah. Go for it. Oh, sorry. I thought the I thought you were going to ask the question no, separately. No, so, no, no, no. That's one question. Dive computer recommendation, and then somebody else asked. Okay. So, so dive computer group. recommendations. Um, I use so at the moment I'm using Shearwater dive computers, and I'm using the Poseidon Mark Twenty Eight dive computer. For technical diving, you need to have a dive computer that allows you to switch gas. All right, that's a Shearwater that um, Simon is showing there. Uh, you, you, you're going to need a you need a dive computer that you can switch you can program multiple gases in. Now there is a little bit of a problem there because a lot of computer manufacturers have started putting in some tech options on computers to try to coax people into buying them, but they're not full tech computers. So yeah, for example, if you have a Cinto a Cinto D4 or say a D6, the D6 you can actually do some gas switches on, and it does work okay as a technical dive computer uh, for the very basic level. But it does penalize you quite heavily if you try to do more than one dive in a day. Um, I would recommend something along the lines with a Shearwater Perdix or a Petrol uh, Taric if you want to go a little fancier and have it watch style. Um, though I prefer the bigger screen. When you're underwater, you it's nicer to have that big block. You can see very clearly. Um, also the Poseidon Mark 28 is a fantastic computer as well. They've, they've uh, used some interesting ways of visualizing the data for you. But those computers are what I would say full tech computers. And even though they have features like Trimix and Rebreather and things you don't think you're gonna use, most tech computers that are worth the money you're spending on them will have all those options because they know that most people eventually will get into one or two of those things. And the idea is you have a computer that'll be set for any diving activities. I have a Shearwater Petrol I had from my first tech course and it, I still haven't come up with a dive that it can't handle yet. So um, I would definitely so, say- um, If we combine that with the program that you just used, because that's a question people often have. Yes, and okay. Asked, so uh, the, the program that I used works with the VPMB algorithm and the Bullman algorithm. Those are two algorithms. 
What you'll see in most standard tech computers is they will give you the option to use something called Bullman or Bielman with gradient factors, okay? Um, this is more of an open source model. Uh, it's, it's easy to find a planning software that'll model that. What you'll find with a lot of other manufacturers, for example, um, uh, Scuba Pro, Oceanic, and all these, they make great computers, but quite often they want to tweak it and have their own algorithm. Well, if you want to tweak it and have your own algorithm and do something quite specific or adaptable, the problem might be it might be hard to find a software that allows you to model what the computer is going to do. Uh, one other point to make, I think, and that's uh, another point, I guess, in the favor of Shearwater is a company as established as them is able to provide really good service. And that's one of the things that they've been able to do for me over the years. I can send them a computer and within a week it's fixed, done, on its way back. And computers do occasionally lose their pressure sensor or other things. So there are some new guys, there are obviously new companies that enter the market with computers, but have a think about how easy it is to get in touch with them and how easy it is if you have a problem if you need service for equipment, how easy you can get the equipment to them to get service. Um, uh, all right. So just to, just to summarize that, so essentially you're saying with the program, you can model exactly what, what the shear water is gonna do for you, right? So you exactly. can actually get- Exactly. Now, the, 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 sometimes there'll be a minor amount of variation. You have a planning tool on your shear water as well. A lot of it will depend on the parameters that you set for when you're planning a dive. But generally, if you look at most of the serious tech computers out there, so the Poseidon Mark 28 shear water, the ratios, the OSTCs, uh, the dive softs, um, all of those will allow you to run Bullman. Even if they have another algorithm they like as well, they will allow you to run Bullman. It's a recreational mode there, Simon. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's right. Um, yeah, they'll allow you to run Bullman or VPMB, which are probably the two most established models. And those are very easy to model in a software. And there are quite a few. I mean, you don't have to go with Multideco. There are a lot of different softwares out there. They all function pretty similar. And you'll... You'll learn, you learn in your course how to work with these and how to, how to plan dives. Um, so I would say when it comes to computer selection, if you're trying to buy something other than the established tech computers, shoot me an email. I'll, I'm happy to have a look at it for you, but I would recommend something along the lines with a Shearwater, Poseidon, a Divesoft, one of those computers. Uh, and then depending on if you're planning on rebreather diving or not, there might be a connection option there as well that you want to consider. Uh, but a good starting point, I mean, a Shearwater Perdix is the easiest place to start. Got it. Yeah, that one. <laughs> yeah. And I'm not sponsored by them. They're just awesome enough that I plug yeah. them anyway. I just, left, right. had, I just recently had the pressure, pressure uh, sensor die and they sent me a new one within, like a new one within a week or two. So yeah, they're really good about that. Their warranty is pretty solid. And they generally, they'll also, whenever you send a computer in, if you have to, they'll do some touch-ups as well. They'll switch out the, the glass plate for the screen. If it's scratched up, they'll give you a new battery plug. They're, they're great guys. They make a fantastic product. And I think because they become so popular, they have the resources to, uh, to come up with new software upgrades and new features and provide quite good service. I think that's, it's almost become a bit of a religion in the tech community that people are stuck on sheer water. I don't go that far, but uh, I do love them as a company. They're great guys. So let me just ask another question. Um, somebody's asking, um, you know, there's a ton of gear that you can buy, but what would you say is a good, you know, aside from the computer, but what would you say is a good investment to get for entry level tech? Um, oh great! All right. Well, I mean, if we look at if we look at your full set of gears, your your um your 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 mask and fins will obviously do. You might want to look into getting a backup mask. Uh, adding on to that, if you have an SMB and a reel, that will do just fine as well. You might just want a slightly longer reel. Moving into kind of your BCD and regulator setup, it depends on if you're going into twin set diving or you're going into side mount. Now, if you already have a wing and a back plate for a single tank, so if you're not using a jacket style BC, but you have a harness with an aluminum or steel back plate and then a wing, for a twin set, all you need to do is switch out the wing. And you can still use your same harness and back plate. So you can buy the wing, a twin tank wing, wing individually, and then that's all you need as far as your BCD goes, okay? Um, side mount, you probably need, I would recommend buying a side mount specific BCD if you're planning on going 
down the side of my road. And we see that more and more people are opting for that option. When it comes to the regulators, they're sold as sets. So you can buy a side mount set of regs. You could also buy a twin set of regs. But the thing is, if we really break it down, a side mount set or a twin set is two first stages, two second stages, uh, and then some hoses and gauges. So if you already have a nice recreational setup, you, you probably already have one first stage you can use and at least one second stage you can use. So you might just need to buy one additional first and second stage with a longer hose and you can build your way to a setup that way. And I'm, I'm always happy to consult on that, but it's a pretty simple step up um, that doesn't necessarily require that much of an investment to adapt the regulators so that you have regulators for a basic kit. Then you have the different riggings for the tanks and decompression regs and these kind of things. Most dive shops that offer technical diving will have all this kind of stuff for rental. And when it comes to the smaller items, uh, you can usually just borrow them. So I would say a base set would be a computer, the right kind of BCD, whether you have a twin tank wing or a side mount BCD, uh, and then the basic reg set. And then if you want to add on to that, you can start looking at getting your own deco reg as well. Uh, but deco regs are quite easy. Deco regs, you'll buy something quite simple. Um, so it would, it, it could be, a, a deco reg doesn't have to cost you more than three, 400 bucks, uh, the, the whole package. We use Scuba Pro Mark IIs, the same that we would use for a recreational dive. Um, so I'd say that's, that's a good start for your basic setup. Cool. Um, let me ask a couple more questions. So I'm going to skip over the CCR uh, questions because they're a bit too technical for what we set out, but we might, you said we might do a webinar about CCR. So stay tuned. Yeah, we, we can have that as a potential option. Yeah. And maybe you could just um, say somebody's asking how many levels of CCR do you teach in Gilly? Uh, right now we're teaching, so we have the 30 meter no decompression we're teaching. Uh, so that, that's basically you can dive the way you dive on your advanced course, but you're using a rebreather. We have 40 meter level, which is uh, using air as a sort as a diluent gas. Uh, and that is then with decompression, there's a 45 meter helitrox level. And then we have the 60 meter mixed gas level uh, that we can offer at the moment. Uh, we will be offering the 100 meter level. I just haven't accrued the correct number of certs to teach that yet. I've already done the course for it. Uh, so we're holding off on the advanced trimix level. It's called the 100 meter level. But for the 30, 40, and 60 meter levels, we teach. Now, one good thing to know is if you're already a tech diver, you're already advanced nitrox and deco, you can start immediately on the deco level with the rebreather. You don't have to do the no deco 30 meter level. That is only for people who are starting without any experience with advanced nitrox and decompression procedures. The, but then I generally recommend that people start off with the open circuit tech courses. So getting advanced nitrox and deco in first before venturing into rebreather because those courses are quite helpful. Uh, otherwise it, it's a lot to learn. Um, so somebody here is asking particularly that question. Um, he's, uh, a Paddy Tech rec dive, he didn't say the level, I guess 40 or 45. And then he would like to actually do Trimix next, but he would eventually like to dive a rebreather. Would you recommend making a rebreather transition before doing Trimix or afterward? Uh, financially, I would say before the way it stands now, helium's gotten so expensive that doing, it, it depends on uh, your budget, of course, but open circuit Trimix is getting to the point now, I think we were looking at the gas required to do a 60 meter dive, would run you about three, four hundred dollars uh, where we are. Now helium's expensive in Indonesia compared to other places. There's a few areas in Europe and in Florida where it's cheaper and there you might find a more reasonable way to do it. But uh, uh, if you're planning on going into the rebreather side anyway, once you've learned the basic open circuit courses like advanced nitrox and deco for tech, I would suggest getting into the re getting in and starting with the rebreather. It's a whole, rebreather is a whole other way of diving. Uh, it's another one of those things where I meet a lot of people who think that doing more and more recreational or technical open circuit dives is going to prepare them better for the rebreather course. It's, it's like starting over from square one in a sense. So um, I would say uh, 
you, there's not that much you can do to prepare other than pr as far as reading the theory and studying the manual of the machine. A lot of it will come into actually you putting the machine on and working with it. Um, let me ask uh, maybe two last questions. Um, oh, sorry, we had a very good question in the beginning, which was, what is the specialty course you suggest for disabled divers wanting to do tech diving? Oh yeah, I love this one. Actually, I have a very good, very good friend of mine. Uh, I, I taught him side mount. He was one of my first side mount students, and, and he's uh, he's he he swam in two Paralympics. He's uh, he was born without his uh, left lower arm and was able to complete the course. Now. This is a very, it's a very, very case by case nature to this because it of course depends on what the person is capable of doing and not capable of doing on their own in the water. So it's very hard to speak generally. I know that there is an agency that specializes in disabled diving uh, recreationally. I think they were called DDI um, that hasn't really swung over to tech. And I think it's just because you're combining two niches. So I think that's that's a dialogue we I've found that because I've had this inquiry come before that we personalize to the person who's interested what their capabilities are what the agency will allow what we can what we can do and and but it becomes more of a case by case thing but I mean I think anybody who wants to be in a sport should be able to give it that try and as long as we can conduct the activities with an acceptable level of risk I uh, I think it's a very interesting area um, but I can't give any, it's hard to give a specific example because it's very case by case. Okay. Um, guys, apologies if we're not going to ask all the other questions, uh, but I will include them in, uh, I will include, um, Phil's email address in the email I'm going to send out later. Um, and then you can ask him any questions directly. Um, so I'm just going to ask one, which I think is really a nice uh, closing one from uh, Theo. What goals are you yet to reach within your tech diving career? Mm. Well, I, there, I have a lot more cave diving to do. That's, uh, that's for sure. And a lot more wreck diving to do. Uh, I really, I've, I've really wanted to dive Plura, uh, in Norway, the deep cave system they made a documentary about with some divers, uh, that had some issues there a few years ago. Um, I've always wanted to dive the deep ridges uh, of Hawaii, especially after seeing the documentary Black Coral. Something's been drawing me there to check that out. But every time I, I try to sit down and think of what my next list of dives are, that list just keeps, keeps getting longer and longer and longer. So uh, <laughs> I think it's a never ending process. Uh, but more exploration, more travel. Um, and I think uh, more, more cave for me, that's what I'm really looking at at the moment. All right. Are there um, any other questions? I think you went silent there, Simon. Sorry, my. Uh, oh, an Esam e the Cento DX is a fine computer. Nothing wrong with that one. It's, I've it's used a one bit myself. fiddly, isn't it? Isn't it a bit fiddly? Uh, it. I don't know. It, the the DX is a the DX is okay. If you have it, you can use it. Most people, as I said, they just opt for the bigger screen. Uh, with the backlit view, but that's that's something that comes. It's it's it, a big part of this is personal preference as well. If you have tools that do the job, you know sometimes you start getting into design features and style. That's a different story. Okay, um, just before everybody leaves, guys, I, I hope you're going to let me show uh, one more important slide, which is our trip this year. Obviously, we don't know if it. Oh, hang on, I have to share the screen. Hang on a second. So um, Phil and I are going to do our truck trip this year um, again, unless, of course, we're not allowed to. At the moment, uh, Truck Lagoon or Chuk, which is the country actually is called, um, is, uh, is currently under lockdown like a lot of islands. Um, but we're monitoring the situation and we will update. But we're still planning. We've got the slot uh, for our tech and rec, which means you can come as a recreational diver or as a tech diver. Um, uh, and it's a great place um, to practice tech, I think, because the conditions are so perfect. Um, so um, that's one trip that you should keep an eye on. Um, I also would like to point out a couple of uh, webinars that are coming in the coming weeks. Uh, we've got a, a professor for marine biology coming to talk about coral reefs um, and uh, fisheries in the Pacific. We've got the World Wildlife uh, Responsible for Sharks and Rays 
Andy Cornish, uh, Dr. Andy Cornish, coming and talking about conservation of sharks and rays and uh, not only the bad stuff, but also uh, some improvements that have been happening. Uh, we had this talk today. I have a series going on about underwater photography. Uh, I've got Photoshop coming out next week. And next weekend, we've also got to talk about humpback whales, um, where uh, a friend of mine is going to show aerial footage of humpback behaviors that have not been seen like that before. So uh, tune in for those. Um, you are going to uh, get an email from us um, about um, um, about this workshop, so all the questions that were asked. But uh, you can definitely always check Insider Academy. That's the link on our page to all the webinars. You could do me a favor and uh, follow our my YouTube channel because I'm trying to reach a thousand, so um, I get better conditions there. So if you would follow the YouTube channel, that'd be really really great. Um, and yeah, I would like to thank Phil for uh, making such a cool talk. Thank you. I like to thank everybody who joined. I really appreciate you guys attending and warmest greetings here from sunny Florida. Yeah, so thanks everybody for tuning in. Also really amazing that you stayed uh, so much longer time. So really good to see that people are interested in tech. And uh, yeah, if we do that CCR webinar, we'll uh, let you know. Um, I'll email everybody who's here if we do this follow-up webinar. We haven't quite decided on that yet, depending on um, Phil's schedule, right? Yeah, schedule. well, I'll probably be in Sweden, so we'll see what we can set up. Cool. All right, guys, thank you so much. Um, thank you for um, joining, and stay safe, wash your hands, and I uh, hope we can all dive together soon. All right. Final shout-out to the Man to Dive crew. Hope you guys are all doing well.